Hey, it's Dr. Brian Mole, the diabetes coach. I am a master licensed diabetes educator, a certified diabetes care and education specialist, and I am IFM certified in functional medicine. I help people reverse type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, and metabolic dysfunction by finding and addressing the underlying root causes using a personalized diet and lifestyle approach. In this video today, we'll be featuring another Ask the Diabetes Coach segment with a question that came again from one of my recent webinars. Actually, there's three different questions that all pertain to fasting insulin. So I thought I'd shoot a video for you guys today on everything about fasting insulin, the blood test, and what we're measuring, why it's important what it is, and what it actually means for your health and your blood sugar control. If you like this video and the content that I'm putting out here for you on my YouTube channel, please do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up. I'd also appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and then click that little bell for notifications so that you don't miss any of my new videos, which I'm putting out every single week. If you want to learn more about how to control your blood sugar with a natural lifestyle approach, there's a gift for you in the description underneath this video called the Blood Sugar Manifesto. Again, just look below this video in the description click that link and you can download the Blood Sugar Manifesto where I give you a roadmap on how to achieve optimal blood sugar control. And lastly, if you enjoy this content and you want to support my work, then you can buy me a cup of coffee with the link below this video in the description as well. Again, just look below this video in the description. There's a link to buy me a cup of coffee and to say thanks. And I appreciate all of your support, including just being here watching this video and sharing it with the people that you care about. So let's get into this topic of fasting insulin. Fasting insulin is a blood test, and of course, it's a hormone that we're measuring in the bloodstream. And insulin is probably the most important hormone when it comes to blood sugar control and metabolic health. Many people are familiar with the hormone insulin. They think about insulin injections for people with type 1 diabetes and some people with type 2. And they think about this hormone that helps us control and regulate our blood sugar, which it does. But insulin does way more than that. Insulin is, in fact, one of the most important hormones when it comes to fuel metabolism and fuel partitioning. So when I talk about fuel, what I'm talking about is the gasoline or the energy substance Substrates in our body that we use to fuel our cells, to give our cells energy. So cellular energy is called ATP, and ATP are produced in the mitochondria of most cells from various substrates. And the two primary substrates that the body uses to produce ATP are glucose and fatty acids. Insulin is heavily involved in how we use those, how we transport those, how we uptake those fuels, or how we store those fuels. The gene that codes for the hormone insulin is well-preserved throughout our human evolution. In fact, some people date it back 500 million years. So it's been with us for a long time, which means that insulin serves an essential and highly important role in human physiology. So let's talk about what insulin does. Insulin is a hormone. It's released by the pancreas. The pancreas is an organ that sits right behind the stomach in the middle of the abdomen. The pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine functions, which means that it releases digestive enzymes into the digestive tract when we eat, and it releases hormones into the bloodstream. The chief hormones that it makes and releases are insulin and glucagon. Insulin lowers blood sugar, glucagon raises blood sugar through different effects on various organs in the body. So the pancreas is like a sensor, and when we eat food, it notices that. It measures the glucose and the fat and the other 
substrates coming into the body and it releases the hormone insulin to help our cells utilize that glucose. In fact, insulin has a variety of effects on different cells in the body. Most cells in the body have receptors for the hormone insulin, but insulin does different things to different organs. For example, in the muscles and fat, it activates glucose transport. So it actually enables muscle cells and fat cells to take up glucose, and then that glucose will get used or stored for energy. In the liver, insulin actually has an inhibitory effect. It actually stops the liver from breaking down stored glucose and releasing it into the bloodstream. So insulin acts like a break on the breakdown of glucose and the release of glucose by the liver into the bloodstream. In the brain, insulin has a variety of effects. It helps to regulate appetite, energy balance, body weight, and glucose metabolism, as well as cognitive function and memory formation. That's why there's a strong connection between insulin resistance and dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. So again, when we eat food, the pancreas measures our bloodstream, notices that we've taken up some glucose and other fuels, and it releases insulin to help our muscles and fat cells take up and utilize that glucose for energy or storage. So after eating, our insulin levels rise. Between meals, our insulin levels should drop and we should see low levels of insulin, but we do need some insulin released at all times. Remember I said that one of the jobs of insulin is to suppress the release of glucose from the liver. It also has an inhibitory effect on fat cells releasing stored fat. So insulin tells our fat cells to hold on to stored fat and not release it by acting on the enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase. So between meals in a fasted state when we're not eating, insulin's main job is an anti catabolic effect. In other words, a suppressive effect. It holds back stored energy in the liver and in the fat cells. So when we do a blood test that measures insulin in a fasted state, we should see some insulin, but we don't want to see elevated insulin. Elevated insulin, which is called hyperinsulinemia, is associated with insulin resistance. In fact, it's an effect of insulin resistance. When we become insulin resistant, and there's a variety of reasons for why that happens, you can check out some of my other videos to learn all about insulin resistance, insulin levels will rise. Why does that happen? Because the body wants to overcome that resistance, and its chief mechanism for doing that is producing more insulin. Just like if you were talking to someone and they couldn't quite hear you, you and they kept saying, what, what, I can't hear you, your response would be to, in all likelihood, talk louder. So you would try to overcome their hearing resistance with more input. The body does the same thing. It produces high levels of insulin to overcome the insulin resistance. Now, that's not the only sign of insulin resistance, but it's one that we can easily measure through a fasting insulin test. Now, many people, when I talk about a fasting insulin test, think that they've actually had it, but in reality, most have not. And that brings us to the three questions that we have for today that prompted this video on Ask the Diabetes Coach. And the first question, which actually isn't a question, it's more of a comment from Patrice. She says, the first time I requested a fasting insulin test, my PA or physician's assistant said, what's that? I couldn't believe it, but I did successfully get the test after educating her. Ha ha. Yeah, Patrice, so true. Many physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners are not familiar even with testing insulin for metabolic health, which when you understand how important it is and what an important marker of insulin resistance it is, should be very surprising. But it's not part of the standard of care. It's not part of the standard tests. So many doctors just don't do it. So you're going to have to ask for this test, and you may even have to beg and plead for this test if you want to have your doctor order it so it can be covered by your insurance. The test is simply called fasting insulin or just insulin. And you want to make sure you do the test in a fasted state. That's 
after at least a 10 to 12 hour overnight fast. Insulin is typically reported in micro units per milliliter, and a normal fasting insulin is right around five. We use a range of two and a half to six. Anything over six is starting to become elevated, and if it's over 10, it's considered hyperinsulinemia. Now you might wanna note that the lab reference range goes up to 24, 25, 26 in some cases, but from a metabolic health perspective, that is nowhere near normal. Normal is right around five. If your fasting insulin is 20, then you have significant hyperinsulinemia and therefore significant insulin resistance. You're making four times the normal amount of insulin in order to try to control your blood sugar. Now, why does the normal range go up so high? This test is often run to test for something called an insulinoma, which is a insulin producing tumor on the pancreas. And so if you're running it for that reason, the lab reference range is gonna be different. But we're talking about doing it for metabolic health reasons. And so we want that fasting insulin to be right around five micro units per milliliter. Now there's another test, which I'm not gonna to talk too much about here in this video, but it's called an insulin response test. That's a test that's done as part of an oral glucose tolerance test where you also check insulin levels. And I'll do a separate video about the insulin response test and how to use that one. But that's a good way to test for muscle and fat cell insulin resistance because you're mimicking a postprandial or post-meal state. It's not a fasted state once you've had that glucose challenge. So today we're talking about fasting insulin and we want that fasting insulin around five. That brings me to the second question from my recent webinar that prompted this video. This one is from Steve and he says, I intended to ask if a fasting insulin below 2.5 is a problem. And that's a great question and we do have to look at it in context. If your blood sugar is perfectly normal, you have a blood sugar of say 80 or 85 and your fasting insulin is under 2.5, then I wouldn't worry about it. I think it's totally fine. If, however, your fasting blood sugar is elevated and your fasting insulin is under 2.5, then we could potentially have a problem, and that's called insulin deficiency. We usually see that associated with type 1 diabetes or LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. But in some cases, you could have type 2 diabetes and be insulin deficient. Another reason why it's so important to measure fasting insulin. So again, if blood sugar is elevated and the insulin is depressed below 2.5, that's a sign of insulin deficiency. Now, the last question today from that webinar was from Judith. And this is an interesting question. She says, in light of the knowledge that one of the reasons for high blood sugar is insulin resistance, and that's associated with high insulin. How come the most common treatment for high blood sugar is giving more insulin? By the way, fasting insulin is hardly ever measured, at least on the commonly used lab panels. And she says, I am from Israel. Okay, it's also not commonly ordered here in the United States for the reasons I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So the question is, if insulin is high in insulin resistance, why are people with diabetes prescribed insulin? And it's a head scratcher. It's a really good question. I'll give you the actual answer and then I'll tell you why it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. So the answer is that if blood sugar is really high, let's say it's two or 300 and doctors have tried other medications like metformin and sulfonylurea drugs and GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors and other medications that are commonly used either in single or combination therapy, and the blood sugar still isn't coming down, then the only thing left from a medical perspective is insulin. And if you put enough insulin into the body, the blood sugar will come down. Unfortunately, there are a ton of side effects that come with that as well, like weight gain, chronic systemic inflammation, increases in complications like cardiovascular disease, and even the possibility of cancer cell, cancer progression. And those have all been documented. There are cases where insulin can be helpful and even necessary, and those are the cases of 
insulin deficiency. Certainly in type 1 diabetes, insulin is life-saving. In latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood, insulin can become increasingly more important over time. And even in type 2 diabetes, if there's an insulin deficiency and the pancreas is not able to produce insulin, then exogenous or injected insulin becomes really important. But the question was about people who have high insulin and are given insulin. Even though there's a rationale for doing it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's really like adding fuel to the fire because the more insulin you put in, the body becomes more insulin resistant. It slows down in the production of its own insulin. The person typically gains more weight and they tend to get worse over time, not better. That's one of the reasons, of course, that we recommend addressing the underlying root cause with comprehensive, personalized diet and lifestyle-based care. So if you want more information about that, then there's a gift that you can download. It's in the description below called the Blood Sugar Manifesto. Look through the description, click the link there for the Blood Sugar Manifesto, and you can read all about how to use an individualized, personalized lifestyle approach to reverse type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. All right, I want to thank you for hanging in there with this video. I hope you learned a lot. I try to give you a lot of background information, not just tell you what test to get and what the number should be, but why to get it, what it means, and why we're actually doing it as part of a workup to understand the mechanisms of why you have high blood sugar in the first place. All right, again, if you like this video content, give it a thumbs up. Put a comment below in the video. Those comments always stimulate some really good conversations. I try to read all of them and give my feedback and subscribe to my channel. Click the bell for notifications so you don't miss my next video, which should be released shortly. Again, this is Dr. Brian Mole, the diabetes coach with Ask the Diabetes Coach. I want to thank you for tuning in. I'll see you back on the next video.